potential of um, genomics for precision medicine in Africa. My special job today is to obviously welcome our invited speakers and to briefly introduce them. So Professor Michelle Ramsey is the director of the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biosciences and the NRF South African Research Chair in Genomics and Bioinformatics. She has had a long and distinguished career and she has received many accolades, accolades and awards. Um, if you look at the pamphlet, they're definitely not listed there. It's a very long list. And if I had to go through her entire CV, we'd be here for about half an hour longer. So I won't. <laughs> but overall, her work has focused on the role of genomic variation in susceptibility to disease in African populations. Now, our second speaker um, is Dr. June Fabian. And she's the research director at the Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center. She's also the director of a newly recognized Witz research entity, which is literally one day old. So it's a neonate, right? <laughs> well done, June. Um, so we'll share more details of that through the faculty soon. Um, but June is a nephrologist by training, and she's a clinician scientist by heart, uh, at heart, and her research focuses on multiple aspects of, of kidney disease. Um, she's been collaborating with Michelle and the Sydney Brenner Institute for many years. Now, normally, uh, I introduce the commentator after our two speakers have talked, but just in terms of keeping the flow of, of the evening, um, I'm going to rather introduce the commentator now, and that's Professor Amanda Krauss. Um, so the commentator is supposed to stimulate public debate and comment on the research that we would have just heard, and she will make some remarks on the presentations, hopefully good remarks. <laughs> and then um, host questions and discussions from everyone in the audience, both here in person as well as online. So for the people that are on the Zoom call, um, if you want to just ask questions, you can post them online as, as the presentations are going on. Uh, so Professor Amanda Kraus is a medical geneticist and head of the Division of Human Genetics. She is also a distinguished pathologist and researcher um, as you can see from the short bio in the pamphlet. And she is dedicated to understanding the genophenotypic uh, relationships in diseases of South African interest, as well as ensuring that her research has clinical impact. And I hope soon we will be inviting her to also, well, she'll be agreeing to give a prestigious research lecture as well. Now, both the speakers and our commentators are truly distinguished as an authority on the subject, as you know, you'll hear in the next hour or so, and they're extremely passionate about their work. They are all dynamic, dedicated, innovative, and really smart women. So hopefully by the end of the evening, we can think of a few more adjectives to add to the list. <laughs> and you can come tell me. Um, so now with that, it's my immense pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Professor Michelle Ramsey. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much, Maria, for that lovely introduction. And thank you also for the opportunity to present this lecture together with June. We're both very honored to present this prestigious lecture for 2023. Um, Dean, distinguished members um, of the faculty and everyone beyond, um, I really appreciate that you've come out on this sort of chilly winter's evening to hear uh, what we have to say. So. 
we thought it was a perfect partnership between uh, looking at basic research and thinking about how that traverses that bridge towards implementation and translation. And that is why we decided to do this partnership between um, me as, as part of the Sydney Brenner Research Group and then June as a clinician scientist, as Maria has said. So um, last year in November, they announced that the world now has eight billion people. And this was only a short 12 years since there were 7 billion people on the planet. And they now anticipate that there will be some kind of plateauing and that it will take much longer to reach the 9, 9 billion mark. And you might ask why this is important. And I think it is important when we think about um, regional differences in the population growth. And you can see here that Sub-Saharan Africa in the pink line there will have the greatest uh, population acceleration over the next couple of decades. And this is because of people living longer, of um, the birth rate continuing to exceed replacement, and because of the high burden of disease, it's really important that we think about how precision medicine can help us manage this tremendous population and its future health. So when we think about health in Africa, there are a number of things to consider. And firstly, we know that Africa suffers disproportionately from health, specifically the burden of infectious diseases, and therefore research has focused on HIV, AIDS, and malaria. But it is true that non-communicable diseases are increasing, and therefore it's important that we also understand and study them and, and focus our research there. Not only are they increasing in prevalence, but the mortality due to non-communicable diseases is also on the increase. And generally, we have a poor healthcare infrastructure and low skill space in Africa, especially when it comes to the introduction of precision or personalized medicine. Generally, in Africa, we also have a paucity of genomic research and data, and African populations tend to be understudied at many different levels. So it's important that we have more data, do more research, so that we can really tailor interventions towards the populations that need it. So this is the message that June and I want to convey to you this evening, and that is that if African populations are to benefit from precision medicine, it's really important that research is done on the continent, on populations who live here. So the outline of the first part of the presentation, about a half an hour that I'll be speaking with you, um, is as follows. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the history of precision medicine here at WITS and the NHLS, talk a bit, a bit about our institute, the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Bioscience. And for those of you who don't know who Sydney Brenner is, just flip your programs and look at the back, you'll see. <laughs> and um, then I'm going to talk about the human genome, which is central to how we interpret data. And then about how increased variation in African populations will really inform uh, precision medicine on the continent. So taking it all the way to common diseases and genetic associations, and then thinking about what clinical utility might look like in terms of uh, genomics and precision medicine. So this is a timeline for you, illustrating, first of all, that we did the first DNA diagnosis, um, prenatal diagnosis, almost 40 years ago here. And I want to acknowledge um, the mentorship and uh, the work of Trevor Jenkins, who started the Division of Human Genetics here at WITS, and who ensured that we were always very aware of the role of genetics and of, of research in ensuring that we offer the right genetic tests and appropriate genetic tests to the populations that we have here. So, um, that sort of progressed towards the about 1994, early 1990s, with the introduction of PCR. I'm sure many of the young people here can't even think of a time when PCR um, discovered. And, you know, we introduced um, carrier testing and prenatal diagnosis for many monogenic disorders using what was then to the South African Institute for Medical Research transformed into the National Health Laboratory Service. And, um, and the work continued 
and I just pioneer of genetic counseling, uh, which is something that has to accompany genetic and genomic tests, um, as well as precision medicine. We now have um, our head of department for the division of human genetics here, and the division offers um, next generation sequencing of about 500 genes for different monogenic disorders. But what is very important is they do diagnosis of genetic disorders, both at a clinical level and at the laboratory level, and carrier testing and prenatal testing, as I've said before, as well as genetic counseling. Um, then in about 2012, we had the H3 Africa project starting, uh, standing for human heredity and health in Africa. This is a pan-African initiative, and two of the projects were nested in um, human genetics and the S um, Sydney Brenner Institute. And um, then in 2014, we consolidated our work at the Sydney Brenner Institute, and next year we'll be celebrating 10 years. So the research themes at the Sydney Brenner Institute um, are all geared towards providing knowledge to inform precision medicine in African populations. I'm not going to go through them um, one by one, but you can see that, that they transverse a, a lot of different areas from complex diseases to pharmacogenomics to population genetics, and then focusing on bioinformatics techniques. Our resources um, are key to doing the research and publishing as we do. And we have a biobank of precious um, DNA samples. And those are a way for us to, to do more research and do more collaborations. We have many databases, um, including phenotype data and genomic data. We have bioinformatics capability. And very importantly, we have a projects office, which helps us manage over 20 different projects at the moment. We, we are part of international consortia, not only those in Africa, but also internationally. And I think, again, it's important that there is data from Africa uh, that is part of the work done by these international consortia. So this is the current staff complement. We're about 40 people now at the Sydney Brenner. And on the top left, you, see, you can see that we are five senior scientists. And we each have our areas of expertise, but we collaborate widely because we think that that is part of the success of the Institute is not working in silos, but working together. You can see that we have a, a projects office with fantastic expertise in managing and navigating uh, the very complex um, logistics of research projects. We then have our biobank and research laboratory, our data and bioinformatics team, a whole lot of postgraduate students, and then post um, postdoctoral fellows. And I just want to thank um, Jocelyn and Lucy for the slide. So um, when we think about the Sydney Brenner, it's all about collaboration. And it's a collaboration within WITS. And I, I know that many of you who are here are our collaborators. And I call you out one by one because then we will be here a very long time. But as you can see, we work across four different faculties. We work with many different organizations, including the NHLS, the Donald Gordon Medical Center, NICD, and all the others shown there. And we also collaborate with many of the um, research entities at WITS, and now we can add a new one, which is really exciting. And um, when we think about you know, the work that we do at the Sydney Brenner, it is about doing basic research. And if we want to implement or translate, we need partnerships to do that. And that is why we work with the NHLS and also work with many of the clinical departments um, across the faculty. And that work is underpinned by um, you know, the, the fact that we have the biobank, that we have um, our, our research um, cluster, you know, we have all the things that we need to make this um, actually work. And today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the work that we do, but then also the collaboration with, um, the, with June, and she's going to um, kind of explain how that partnership uh, works. So um, the Sydney Brenner has, has partner projects and uh, collaborations across many parts of the globe, including many countries in Africa, and these are our main funders. 
I think one of our success stories is um, the people who leave us, and that is about um, being so proud of our PhD graduates and our postdoctoral fellows who now have positions in different parts of the world, and this is naming just about 15 of them. So now I'm coming to the next part, which is really talking about the human genome and showing you again that you know, our work and research has really evolved alongside the development of the human genome. So the, the human genome project started in 1990 and was declared complete in 2003, but it still had lots of gaps. There were then many technological advances and eventually um, you know, we now have a very full telomere to telomere genome. And you can see that it was only in 2020 that they had the first two chromosomes where we had a telomere to telomere se sequence, and then two years later, that full genome. And in May this year was the publication of the draft human pan genome reference sequence. And what is important and impactful about this is that um, it no longer gives us a linear genome, but gives us a lot more information. And when they uh, developed this pan genome, over 50% of the participants were from Africa. And I think that is really important because we need to understand the genetic variation of African populations. And this enables us to do better um, calling of variants because we can now um, better align our DNA sequence to do this. So Africa is a very complex continent. You can see the four major language groups here. Lots of migrations occurring since the emergence of anatomically modern man about 200,000 years ago. And this has led to very complex uh, population structure across the continent. Um, a lot of work has now been done trying to understand what the readiness is or capabilities for precision medicine and genomics across the continent. And what you can see from this analysis, um, which was done just a couple of years ago, is that the greatest activity and preparedness is actually in South Africa and in Egypt. And what you can see is that there are still many parts of the continent where there is very little capability for um, precision medicine. But on the, on the positive side, um, there are many initiatives now that are looking at uh, generating more data and, um, and, and resources for genomics in Africa. And you can see the H3 Africa Consortium there having started more than 10 years ago, uh, really making a huge contribution, especially to networking across the continent. And then this EU Africa Personalized Medicine Initiative, which started in 2020 and is really uh, now mapping out a way forward for precision medicine, um, where it is a partnership between African countries and European countries. And then the DSI Africa Initiative, which started in 2021, and again is about using data from African studies and thinking about um, you know, how we can use that to, to also develop algorithms and precision medicine approaches. Um, we were from the beginning part of the Southern African Human Genome Program, and I'm very excited that there is now an initiative looking at developing an African population cohorts consortium. And I've put there watch the space because the, um, the MRC and the Department of Science and Innovation is now um, beginning discussions about starting a 110,000 human genome project in South Africa, which will have both phenotype and genomic data and will enable a lot of research to be done. So this um, is a landmark paper in Nature of which the Sydney Brenner um, was very much a part under the umbrella of the H3 Africa Consortium. And this was about interpreting over 400 whole genome sequences from 50 different ethno-linguistic groups and identifying through the sequencing over 3 million novel variants. And this is something that continues to um, be true, that whenever you uh, sequence a whole genome from an African participant, you will find many, many novel variants that have not been um, described or submitted to any databases. So we use the genetic data to um, look at the affinities between different populations, because this tells us something about migration and admixture. And what you can see here is if we do principal component analysis and each of those symbols representing a person, and we look at the first principal component on the x-axis, 
what we can see there is it's giving us a split across Africa between East Africa and the rest of Africa. And on the second principal component, um, you can see that the African populations are splitting in terms of West Africa, Central Africa and Southern Africa. But what you can see is it's almost like a continuum. So that populations that live close to one another tend to admix and have more similarities to one another. And this you can also see in this uh, structure plot here where every horizontal line um, is really representing an individual. And you can see all the green lines on top of one another showing the homogeneity in uh, individuals of European origin. And when you look at Africa and you look at all those different colors, because in this particular graph, it has been modeled for 10 ancestral groups. You can see the variation in people from different parts of Africa, but also almost every individual is it mixed within, um, you know, with the, their neighboring population. So that is, that is a very important message to come through. But we see structure also within a country or an area. So when we look at South Africa, we can see here with the, the major language groups shown in the map on the left and then matched in color to the principal component um, in the middle. And what you can see is at least three groups um, being shown here as being um, genetically um, defined. And that also has implications in terms of precision medicine. Because when we look at these variants um, and the prevalence of the variant alleles in the different uh, language groups, you can see that there are many differences. And these are all variants that have some kind of clinical significance. So, for example, the PCSK9 variant on the left is associated with uh, lipid levels. And on the right is the APOL1 gene variant and June's going to tell you a lot more about that and its association with kidney disease. So, you know, again, saying we need data so that we can actually understand the differences and think about how they impact um, personalized medicine going forward. But this tremendous variation also presents us with very interesting uh, challenges and opportunities. And I think, you know, we really want to see the opportunities in studying these diverse um, African genomes. So first of all, there's three things that I just want to tell you about um, African genetic diversity and precision medicine. So first of all, um, because of the increased genetic diversity, this means that we have enhanced discoverability. And here, um, what you can see is, again, each of the symbols represents an individual, and then you can see the different populations reflected there in the clusters of Europeans, Asians, and Africans. And this shows the number of variants that vary from the reference sequence. And you can see for European and Asian populations, it's about 4 million. But when you look at African populations, they have about 5 million differences from the reference sequence, so a lot of increased variation. I've shown you already a principal component analysis, and this is also including European uh, populations on the right there. And you can see how, how far um, they, they differentiate from the African populations and just how much more diversity there is in African compared to non-African populations. And then um, understanding that there is limited transferability of discoveries in European populations when you apply them to African populations. So this is a polygenic score, which is based on European populations. And you can see there that it predicts much better in European populations in the blue for multiple traits than it does for the African populations. So the problem is that there's very little data on African populations. You know, when we look at these figures from 2009 to 2016, we might get excited if we see that it's gone from half a percent to three percent. But what we have to remember is these are African Americans and not continental Africans. And when we look at more recent data, we can see that Africa continues to be poorly represented in genome wide association studies. And you can see how in recent years, European population studies have just increased tremendously, whereas the African ancestry studies have not increased nearly as much. In studying different areas like um, cancer or non-communicable diseases like diabetes and kidney disease. 
Africa, and because the, the variation is so different, it has been necessary fossils that were developed in European populations. And this is also very true in a diagnostic setting. We have to be very well trying to use it in a population where we don't have enough information and data to make sure that we actually are predicting them. These tools have been uh, developed by the H Bionet, the Bioinformatics Network. And the Sydney Brenner um, members have played a big role in developing an African specific array for genotyping and, and genetic association studies. It has looked very carefully at um, how best to impute variants in data sets and has also developed um, a lot of uh, genome wide association pipelines. And there, there are many people that we need to acknowledge, not only the one shown here, um, for the work that has been done to build these resources that are now being widely used by others. So I just want to briefly um, tell you about the um, four country cohort that we've built under the umbrella of H3 Africa, and we call that AWIGEN, which stands for the Africa VITS in-depth partnership for genomic studies. And you can see that last year we celebrated 10 years of this project and many of you will recognize yourselves in the, that photo um, because this has been a collaboration not only with WITS participants um, and but also um, through um, in many different countries in Africa. So the objective of the AWIGEN study is to build these large longitudinal cohorts and a research platform that can used, be used for our purposes, but also be shared with others. And it is about um, older adults from rural and urban settings in West, East and South Africa. And the idea is to explore genetic susceptibility and gene environment interactions that are driving this increase in non-communicable diseases. Um, and this shows you in Africa where we work, and this is a cohort of about 12,000 individuals, and at baseline, they were between the ages of 40 and 60 years, and we were delighted to have funding to actually extend this into a, a set of longitudinal cohorts, where we had about 60% retention of the cohort. So these are the cardiometabolic disease endpoints that we're looking at. And you can see it's hypertension, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease, and dyslipidemia. And we, we looked at non-modifiable factors like age, sex, ethnicity, or genetic uh, uh, composition, and also at many of the mediators of disease. And this is very important because with all this data, you can ask so many questions, and you can examine so many um, interesting um, problems. So, you know, this was a project that was very complicated, working across six different sites, having to ensure that everybody collected the data in the same way, so that it was really comparable. So there was a lot of training being done of the teams, the field work teams, and, um, you know, this was, was essential before actually going into the field and starting to take measurements. In some of the centers where we worked, they didn't have laboratories, so they didn't have any experience in collecting samples, and that was part of what we did was to build this capacity across the different uh, partner regions. Now, one of the outcomes, because this is a population cross-sectional study, was actually to develop um, knowledge on the prevalence of diseases like um, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And what you can see across these six centers in Southwest and East Africa is that hypertension is extremely common. Um, and when we look at South Africa, we can see that obesity is more common than in the other regions, and diabetes and chronic kidney disease also more common there than it is in the West African sites, which are more rural sites. But in South Africa, we're looking at both rural and urban sites, so it's not only a rural-urban difference, but also regional difference uh, across the continent, reflecting, of course, the epidemiological transition. So we've published many different papers, over 40 papers from this project. And here are just some of the ones that are on the genetic analysis, but I'm not going to go into them because there's, there's just so much uh, detail here. But the important thing is that it's allowed us to find um, novel associations um, in these populations to various of these diseases, but also to um, 
replicate many of the things that have been found in other populations. So when we think about um, potential clinical applications, people are now talking about polygenic risk scores. And this is about taking a population and um, looking at genetic risk and being able to stratify the population into people who have a high risk, low risk, or moderate risk. And if you think about it, this is an opportunity for intervention, because if you know who is going to have a high risk for a particular non-communicable disease that is a late onset, you could intervene earlier and therefore somewhat modulate the risk for a better health outcome. So this is what it looks like when you apply a polygenic risk score to a population, that it has a normal distribution with most people having a moderate risk, but some having a very high risk and some having a much lower risk. But what we have to remember is that when we look at the distribution of polygenic risk scores in individuals who are unaffected controls and those who have the disease, you can see that it's not as if we see two independent peaks, they somewhat overlap, which shows you that some people who have a high genetic um, risk score may not be affected and the other way around. So this is very important to remember. And then also when we look at the predictivity of the polygenic risk scores, um, if you think about late onset diseases, um, you know, there may not be any differentiation in terms of disease in younger ages, but at later ages, you can see that those individuals who have a higher genetic risk are more likely to get the disease as you would expect. But imagine if you could do that so much earlier and know who fits into which category. And one of the issues that um, is, is really tough, and I've alluded to this before, is that because of the fact that the research has been done predominantly in populations of European origin, they don't translate well or transfer well to other populations. And what you see here is a polygenic risk score based on European data has now been put at one in terms of European population prediction and predicts lower in American and South and East Asian groups, but you can see that it predicts most poorly to African populations. So um, we develop these, these risk scores, we validate them, and then we test them. And this is all very important. But we all understand that complex diseases are the result of genetic predisposition, but also of um, environmental factors and environmental risk. So you can modulate your risk if you know that you're in a high risk category um, in different ways. So what is not under your control is genetic modulators, but the example here is familial hypercholesterolemia in the context of coronary artery disease. If you have one of those mutations, you um, will have a higher risk, but it's important to know that. And then if you modify your lifestyle, you can reduce your risk. And also by using certain medications, for instance, statins, you can reduce your risk for coronary artery disease. So I'm just going to showcase a little bit of work done by one of our PhD students, Michelle Kemp. And this is very preliminary, but I wanted to show you how we are looking at polygenic risk scores and predictivity in the Abigen study. So she's gone uh, through this process of genetic association, developing the score, and then testing the score in the Abigen study. The disease outcomes here are diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And she's used as her discovery a group, a group from um, different parts in Africa referred to in this publication as the Uganda Genome Resource, and applied that to the target Awigen study. And what she's shown is that you can improve predictivity by accounting for ancestry. So if you don't account for ancestry, it's using the, it shows you the red bar here for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and, um, and obesity. And what you can see in the green is that if you include um, ancestry, you, that predictivity increases. Um, she also uh, used a, a process of including multiple poly polygenic scores for related traits, and 14 of them are shown here, to improve predictivity. And again, you can see combined in the green bar that there is an increase if you put all of that information together. 
So that, that is um, important in terms of, of trying to build models that use different uh, data and information to make sure that you can predict better um, you know, who is likely to get um, either any of these conditions. She's then taken this a step forward and um, not only looked at genetic risk, but also looked at non-genetic factors like behavior, smoking, drinking, diet, exercise, and sleep. And combined that and showed that if you have just genetic factors, those are the red bars, that's your predictivity. If you have only non-genetic factors, you can see that that's actually more predictive than genetic factors of getting a particular condition. But if you combine the two shown in the green bars there, your predictivity is much increased. And um, for hypertension, for example, the Predictivity has increased from 12% to 14% and for obesity from 16 to 21%. So this is hot off the press, something that was published um, just a few weeks ago, showing that if you develop a polygenic risk score based on multiple um, ancestries, that that will be a better predictor. But what I want to show you in this, this picture from uh, the article is that, you know, if you then apply it to African European and Asian populations, um, again, you see big differences. So all the red spots here is when you use that multi-ancestry polygenic risk score. But on the left is how poorly it predicts in an African population compared to European and Hispanic ancestry here. So again, you know, despite the fact that you have these multi-ethnic predictors, they still don't translate well because we don't have enough data from Africa. And that is shown here in, in this where the pink um, is representing Africa. And, and you can see the small contribution that the African data is actually making to uh, the polygenic risk scores for different traits. And this is really important. So the take home here is that the predictive capacity of polygenic risk scores is relatively low in terms of what we expect based on the heritability of the trait. So they're still not perfect. Um, we also know that there's lower power of polygenic risk scores in non-European populations like African populations. And um, the fact that there isn't a lot of African data means that this is a huge opportunity for us to contribute more African data to these kinds of studies. So when we do research in Africa, it's of benefit not only to people in Africa, but also to the global population, because much of the global populations is a subset of populations that left the African continent and only took some of the variation with them. So we have that opportunity for novel discovery. Um, in African populations, we can also enrich databases with information that is useful in terms of interpreting genetic variants found in any population. And then, of course, there is now a very large African diaspora that will benefit also from the work that we do here in Africa. So I'm just taking you back to our main message, which is if African populations are to benefit from precision medicine, it's really essential that we do research in Africa on continental African people. So with that, I'm going to hand over to June and she'll take you through um, some of the applications of this work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle, for setting the scene so beautifully. <laughs> So, um, and again, I'd like to just echo my thanks to the faculty for the invitation to share some of our research. It's the same presentation. <clears throat> just go back to where you were. This just goes to the next one. In the wrong
I think we're okay. That was for the online crowd. Um, yeah. So what Michelle and I thought we would share is maybe some more practical um, examples of the kidney disease-related genomics work that we've done looking at African populations. And I'm very glad to see Steve here because he's been a very bad nephrology student to date. So I'm hoping that um, you can shine tonight, Steve. Um, but what we thought we would do is look at um, the overarching theme really is if we are going to do genomics research, what we really want to do is to be able to translate that. And the translation means that we want to improve the health outcomes of individuals and at a public health and population level. That's ultimately what we want. So what we're going to do is give you some population level examples of the research that we've done. And then at an individual level, what we would like to do is to show you something in relation to diagnostics and therapeutics. And then the last thing we'll do is go to the trickier, harder bits, which is how to really translate it practically. So to pretext this, our kidney disease research has um, kind of evolved out of a collaboration that has been continental with Malawi, South Africa, and Uganda. And Steve and Kathy have hosted that part of the work in Agincourt and fortunately hosted me with my PhD in Agincourt. And um, there have been senior scientists at WITS that have been involved with this. Jaya George was involved with a lot of the chemical pathology work besides Steve and Kathy, Michelle, and also Alicia for her sins, who was one of my <laughs> PhD supervisors, and Sarah Lanaika. So that's how ARC started. And we have amazing collaborators in the UK at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And as the collaboration has evolved, so have our collaborators. And I think in relation to genomics, we have to acknowledge Sherry Winkler, Michelle, who's been our champion, and she's been to Agincourt, and she did a lot of the APL1 genetics work for us when we actually couldn't do it here in South Africa. We sent all our samples to her lab. So one of the quite simple questions that we wanted to ask with the ARC project is, are we measuring kidney function correctly in African populations? And it sounds quite obvious, and I'm sure a lot of the clinicians here can relate to the GFRs that we do or in millions of laboratories all over the world every day. And the key thing about that is that it's an estimate, and it's an estimate based on an equation that's modeled in a population. And the reason we questioned that is because the first model that happened was on white men in Canada, 200 of them. And what's really interesting is the Cocroft and Galt equation developed, published a factor that adjusts for women, but there's no woman in the study and nothing is mentioned on how they derived that factor. So for Women's Month, I just thought I'd throw that in. But what happened with the MDRD equation in 1999, which was developed in the US, is that they developed a coefficient for black race. And what that means is if you're African American, your GFR gets adjusted up by 12% compared to other population groups. And the rationale behind that was that in African Americans, Are small, and that's what they used to justify the race based coefficient. So, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to bore you because you're not all nephrologists with all of the other equations that have evolved. But one of them, called the CKDEP, does deserve mention because it adjusts your GFR upwards by 16% if you're an African American. And that just used the data from the MDRD. And the reason that is significant is because it became a very strong focus point in the Black Lives Matter movement. As an example, for highlighting racialized medicine in the US. But also what it means for African-Americans is that if your GFR gets adjusted upwards, 
and you do have kidney disease, it's underdiagnosed, which means referrals into care with nephrologists are delayed and referrals for listing for transplantation are also delayed. Those are the practical implications of these adjustments. So the question we asked when the coefficients were derived was that they became the international standard and it was recommended globally to try and standardize kidney function that these be used. But the question was, how relevant is it for our population? And Jaya George actually did some of this preliminary work showing that these equations totally overestimated kidney function in our settings. And that's what we set out to do with the ARC collaboration. Just as an aside, um, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, the CKD EP equation has been remodeled without a race-based adjustment. And that's called the race neutral equation. What I also find quite interesting about the politics of nephrology is that the Europeans developed all sorts of equations that actually work really well and have no race-based coefficients, but they've kind of never got any traction. And the dominant narrative in terms of renal disease is quite American-centric and it remains so. And I think that's possibly why these equations haven't um, gained much traction. So basically what we did in um, Uganda, Malawi, and South Africa is we did a whole study that was standardized where we measured GFR using our hexol. And that means we actually measured people's function. We didn't estimate it. And then we looked at how all of these equations work. And this is what we found. So the black line is the hexol GFR. And all the lines that come after that, that go to the right, are all of the equations that I've just shown you. And all I want you to understand from this is that what you can see is GFR is shifted upwards. Everything shifts to the right. So what we demonstrated here is that all the equations that we've been using are overestimating your GFR and therefore underdiagnosing kidney disease in African populations. So that was the key finding of our work that we did as the R collaboration. So I want to show you in this animation what that means. So in this animation, what we did is we developed a model based on the hexal GFR, and we used the race neutral equation, which is the one that's recommended. And what you can see here is that this is the prevalence of kidney disease if you use the race based equation or the race neutral equation. But if we use GFR, this is the prevalence of kidney disease. So the bottom line is that across multiple countries in Africa, using the current equations, even the new race neutral equation is underestimating the prevalence of kidney disease. So the question is, if, if this is happening, why is it happening? And one of the things that we thought of is that this assumption based on African-Americans is that has kind of been osmosed into Africa. And the assumption is that African populations have higher creatinines than other population groups. So we thought, well, maybe we should look at that. So we did that. And our colleagues in the UK got population creatinines from the UK in the National Health Survey for England. And what we found was actually the opposite. So what you can see here, if my pointer is working. Um, in this top line over here is the population creatinine for men in the UK and for women in the UK at the top. And what you can see that Malawi, Uganda, South Africa, all of our men and all of our women, in fact, have lower creatinine, higher creatinine assumed. So when we found this, we thought, uh oh, let's just double check this. And Michelle um, shared her data with us. And what we found in the Awigen data set, which is different countries in Africa, we found exactly the same thing. So again, I think the point is just to be made that we need to do the research here. And I think the other thing that we need to, is that the take home message is, is that a lot of research is done and that defines our practice and we osmose that and bring it in. And I think a lot of what we're doing here, we don't think about whether it's right or wrong or appropriate. And those are the things I think that we need to start thinking about with our practice. So I'm just going to take you to, as Michelle mentioned earlier, APL1. 
And again, this was sparked by clinicians observing in the US that African Americans had much more kidney disease than other population groups. And I think I also just want to highlight the power of the clinicians at the coalface, because it's the clinicians that pick up the patterns that don't fit, that don't work. And it's following on from that, that often uncovers groundbreaking research like this. So clinicians were saying there's something different and could it be genetic? And to cut a long story short, there are variants of this um, protein called APL1 that they found in African-Americans and traced them back to West Africa. And these kidney disease variants that occur in African-Americans protect you against sleeping sickness. The downside, if you have two copies, is that it causes kidney disease. So it evolved as um, a survival advantage, but the downside is that it can cause kidney disease. And I'll explain how that happens. It's taken us a while to work it out. But what we call um, the high-risk genotype for kidney disease are these variants called G1 and G2. And um, I'll show you the work that has been done. But just to pretext this, if you do not have an African ancestry, you will not have the variants of APL1. So they only occur in people of African ancestry. And you can see from this plot here that there's no APL1 here. And the APL1 that's here originally is from the transatlantic slave trade. So these APL1 variants were taken across to the US and the South Americas. And the split that you can see here is the parasite that transmits. That's um, Gambienzi and that's Rhodesienzi and that's the Rift Valley that splits them. And these variants both affect how that infection gets transmitted and how you get protected if you have the variants. So in the US, African Americans have been extensively studied in relation to APL1 disease. And 13% of African Americans today carry these two risk variants. And what we know from them is that they often have a strong family history of kidney disease. If you're young, you develop proteinuria and then your GFR starts to drop. We know this. You've got an increased risk of developing kidney disease. You've got a four times higher chance of developing kidney failure. And also there are very specific conditions that are related to the APL1. So for example, SARS-CoV-2 infection, HIV infection. If you've got these variants, you could get kidney disease from that. The really interesting thing as well is that it tends to transplantation. So if I'm carrying two variants and I donate a kidney to someone, that kidney doesn't perform as well, but I also am at risk of kidney disease because I have the variants. So the risk with transplantation lies in the donor, not in the recipient. But there are a few things we don't know about it. And what we don't know is that of those 13% who carry the high-risk genotypes, only 20% of them will get kidney disease in their lifetime. And we think that's because you need a second hit. So you have this vulnerability, but then you get HIV, or then you get hypertension, or then you get SARS-CoV-2, and that precipitates your kidney failure. What's also really interesting is that there's no association with kidney disease and APL1 at all. And we also don't understand that. But if you look at conditions where there is an association, the associations are pretty strong. So, Steve, this is for you. Um, this is how APL1 kills the, uh, kills the parasite. APL1 inserts itself as a pore. It causes the parasite to swell and pop, and then it dies. The question is, how does it damage the kidney? So this is the glorious kidney. Um, these are podocytes, which are the final part of your filtration barrier. And APL1 does exactly the same thing. It inserts itself into the podocyte as a pore, and then it causes the podocyte to swell and get ill. Decision medicine, the last 15 years, two weeks ago, the first phase two clinical trial showed that there is a molecule that blocks that pore and vents kidney disease disposition.
<laughs> What's a bit worrying is it's 850 US dollars for five milligrams, and people are on doses of 15. So then the question was, if there's this huge association with APL1 in African-Americans, surely it must work in South Africa and kind of jettisoned South Africa into the APL1 arena. And she did that with a really interesting study with Alex Casimbelli for his PhD, where they showed an odds ratio of 89, so an 89 times higher risk of HIV-associated nephropathy if you have the APL1 genotype. So um, what's really interesting is that these were the dark days of HIV when we had no access to antiretrovirals. And since advent of antiretrovirals, the association with HIV nephropathy and kidney disease and APL1 has kind of melted away. And we think it's because of the inflammatory cascade that gets accelerated with untreated HIV. And that probably applies to other viral infections as well. But what you can see here is the association with FSGS is quite weak compared to what's seen in African-Americans. And there have been other studies in the DRC. And what's probably the most interesting thing is that there's no high van in Ethiopia and in East Africa. And it's not because of me. It's because the frequency of these APL1 risk alleles is really, really low. So that just shows you how disease manifestation is changed by the prevalence of this genotype. So there are other potential second hits that Sarah has looked at. So the next big question was, could we have a really strong association with hypertension and APL1 in South Africa? And this is um, one of uh, Sarah Liz's other PhD students' work, um, Unati Nkrebelele, and she looked at people with renal failure and their families, and there was no association with APL1 at all. So all of this contradicts quite strongly with what was seen in African-American populations. So Michelle and I have looked at the Arwegen data and JT is the really clever one. He did all the statistical analyses. Um, so just acknowledging JT as well. But what we did is we looked at the frequencies of APL1 high-risk genotypes in West, East and South Africa. And what you can see is that from region to region, they're quite different. You can see how low they are in East Africa, alluding to what I was talking to earlier. But you can see that they're the highest actually in Agincourt. Taking that a step further, what we also found is that within different ethnic groups within each country, the variation of these alleles is really quite big. And again, you can see here, the G2 allele predominates in South Africa, Allele frequencies are much lower in East Africa and kind of intermediate in West, again, with the highest in the Titsonga and um, the vendor populations. So in terms of kidney disease, um, we looked at people with a low GFR of less than 60 in the Arwegen cohort, and we looked at people with albuminuria. And surprise, we didn't find any association at all with GFR, which is the strongest association that's seen in African-Americans. And we did see an association with albuminuria, but it does vary from region to region. So again, just showing that this is quite a different picture when you look at it in our African setting. So we'd like to just move to maybe some more individual level examples, and this is on the basis of diagnostics. And I think every speciality in medicine has its special headache. And with pediatric nephrology, it's the steroid resistant child with nephrotic syndrome. So what Michelle and I did is that we looked at different mutations. And what's really interesting is if you look at the literature from the early 1960s, clinicians again are observing around them that there are differences in how different population groups present with nephrotic syndrome. So it's been well described that in our black children, their nephrotic syndrome is more severe, they are more resistant to drugs, and they often progress to renal failure. And what the clinicians were asking is, could this potentially be something that's genetic? So um, again, Steve, this is for you. <laughs> this is a lovely, healthy podocyte. And what it looks like, it's got all these interdigitating fingers that form the filtration barrier. And this is what it looks like when it's sick. 
And with relation to um, steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, there are a few genes that have been identified, but the gene that we looked at is called podocin, and it affects the functioning of the podocyte. And what we found is that in a third of black children with steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, they have an African specific mutation called the MP, well, the podocin V26E. So it's homozygously inherited, you need two copies. But this mutation has not been described in other populations. It's only found in populations of African ancestry. And we have also been able to show that it occurs in a group that have done this in KwaZulu-Natal. So this is work of one of our master's students, Melanie. And when we looked at whether these children progress to kidney failure or not, what you can see is children who have minimal change or steroid sensitive disease, their kidneys are fine. If you don't have the mutation, your kidney doesn't do as well, but if you have the mutation, your kidney, kidney decline is quite severe. So the utility of this test for clinicians spares the child unnecessary exposure to drugs, long stays in hospital, and potentially enables you to tell you who's gonna do really badly. It also helps you to, to do genetic counseling for the family and to potentially screen other children who might be affected. And I think what was really nice <laughs> is we did manage to get the screening test up and running at the NHLS. And I'm gonna bat this to you, Amanda, about why it's not running anymore. But again, it's one of the things that we need to discuss in terms of um, sustainability and translation. And then I think the last example we wanted to share with you is from some work that um, we're doing in partnership with the CSR, with Michelle and Colin Masimirembwa at Sydney Brenner and Wittstrom Gordon Medical Center. And we're building a repository of liver tissue donated from African donors to enable pharmacogenomic testing and screening. And hopefully it will become a preclinical platform for drug testing. And again, one of the clinicians and all of the clinicians, if you speak to them, they'll say, our black children post-transplant need tons more tacrolimus. And part of the problem with that is it takes much longer to get them to therapeutic levels, which puts them at risk of organ rejection. And also it costs a lot of money because tacrolimus is really expensive. So what we decided to do is just with the help of Colin and Michelle, as we wanted to look for whether there's a genetic explanation for this. And the cytochrome P450 enzyme system metabolizes most of the drugs that we all take, um, some of us more than others. But the cytochrome P450 system is the one that's involved in the metabolism of tacrolimus. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but all we wanted to show is that when we looked at our donors, so remember in living donors, you have often a mom to a child or a parent to a child, but it's the donor organ that becomes the genotype for the recipient. So we looked at the donor genotypes, and then we looked at the tacrolimus levels post-transplant in the recipients. And what you can see here is that if you metabolize the drug extensively, you have a specific genotype, and only our black donors had that specific genotype. Um, and most of our white donors have what we call the non-metabolizer phenotype. And what's really interesting is that because drugs are tested in European populations, it's the non-metabolizer phenotype that becomes the reference, not the metabolizer, which would be our reference if we did the testing here. So what you can see is that our donors look just like other African donors where the metabolizer phenotype predominates. And in Europeans, it's the opposite way around. So the implications of this are that the recommended starting doses or the re recommended doses for tacrolimus are based on the non-metabolizers who don't make the enzyme. They're not based on the metabolizers who have a beautiful enzyme that metabolizes the drug really quickly and their levels are really low. 
So how does this impact? What we did is we looked at tacrolimus levels in our children post-transplant. And what you can see is that if you're a metabolizer, your drug levels are really low compared to if you're a non-metabolizer, which is most of our white and Indian children. So this is a quite tangible way of realizing how pharmacogenomics does impact metabolism. And I'm looking at Brendan because there's so much on clopidogrel and all sorts of drugs that we use every day that have got recommended doses depending on your genetics. And none of us are doing the screening for our patients. So what I also realized with this, which I never knew about before, is that there's a consortium that defines or recommends what the doses are. And for people who are tested and known to be metabolizers, the recommended starting dose is twice the normal dose for tacrolimus. At the moment, in the transplant unit, every child gets the same dose. Um, so the implications of what we could potentially do with this are, are obvious. Um, so again, I think also just bearing in mind the role of clinicians and how we translate this into practice. If I think about what I learned at genetics when I was at med school, it's changed a lot. And um, this is a study done by Michelle and Michelle, Michelle's um, PhD student. And the only part I had in the study was to be their guinea pig because they piloted the survey on me and I did quite badly. But the bottom line is that they looked at clinicians and they asked them what they know about precision medicine. And what you can see is that less than 25% of clinicians actually use genetic testing. Um, only 14% of them had formal training. Uh, most of us didn't really know much. And what I think is probably the really nice take home message is that more than 80% of clinicians recognize the value of precision medicine and how this could improve care. The barriers are the high cost, um, the limited access to genetic services, and obviously the training gap. And those are things to think about. Are we training our medical students now appropriately? How do we train all the clinicians who are already out there who haven't been trained? Um, and these are all the practical things to think about. And then I think, Franco, you and I have had lots of conversations about this, but equitable access is a big deal. Um, so, for example, the, if we can't get this test at the NHLS with Amanda, you can send it overseas to a company called Invite. They charge 400 US dollars for the test, which is obviously out of the scope of a lot of people. So, again, it's about the technology is there, but are in vitae going to be able to screen for an African specific mutation? Perhaps not. And then the other thing I just wanted to highlight in terms of kidney disease treatment is that we have these amazing new treatments. So, for example, there is treatment for prim primary hypoxaluria. They're doing a trial at Nelson Mandela with Cecil Levy. It's 493,000 US dollars a year for life. This is lifelong treatment. Fabry's disease, really rare genetic disease. We now have precision medicine. We've got this amazing amends, enzyme that we can give to replace. It's 290,000 US dollars per year for life. So I think that takes us to the point of there are a whole lot of other things that need to be in place for us to be able to practice precision medicine if we want to effect a change for individuals that we're caring about and at population level. And I think all of you, we don't need to go through all of this, but I think it's also about questioning how we define impact because I think there's a lot of challenge around, is the scientist's role just to get it into publication and put it out there? Or are we going to define our impact by whether we got the change to the child with nephrotic syndrome or the woman at Barra who's not responding to tamoxifen for her breast cancer, for example? So I think there's a whole lot of things that we need to think about. And I'm not going to labor the point, but maybe we can talk about a little bit in the discussion. So that's kind of what we need to do the research here needs to be led by African investigators.
that must I mean, I think it remains for Michelle and I just to say that we don't do anything alone. So work has been enabled by so many people. So just a very heartfelt thank you to has supported us in different ways um, to get this research done. And yeah, stop there. Is that better? Can you hear me? Good. Okay. So um, I really, I don't think that I need to say that you've just heard two outstanding talks around genomic research in Africa. And really, I think the very clear message that's come out of them around the importance of doing work in Africa on African populations so that our message of improving health in Africa is, is very much our focus. So I think what both Michelle and June have illustrated is the ongoing need for more extensive research to really focus our research and understand things at a much higher level but also, I guess, the massive opportunities that our continent offers us and our environment offers us in terms of doing research. So I think June, particularly Michelle as well, have, have alluded to the clinical significance and how without doing this work, actually, we may be treating patients wrongly, treating patients inappropriately, um, and how important it is for our patients that we translate this at the local level. Um, so I think the, the Eurocentric tunnel vision view that we've probably all been taught as medical students, as laboratory scientists, is something we have to fight and we have to undo. We're in Africa, and really that is the very clear message. So I think Michelle's talk has highlighted the very broad genomic diversity in Africa, how important it is, how broad it is, and actually still how little we know and how, how much we still need to know. So not only at the level of understudy populations, but even within populations, just you know, how diverse it is even within one country and, and how we need to use that to translate into, into um, precision medicine. So um, importantly, June has, has referred to the sort of dogma of accepting the global north. Again, I think something that we as med students certainly probably, well, we were all taught and how we need to undo this dogma and teach our, our students um, appropriate things so that patients don't get inappropriate care and get what they need. Um, June has shown the relevance to a common childhood condition to steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. And I'll <laughs> take my bait a little bit later, I think. Um, but also how, you know, just the practicalities of underdosing, underdosing patients or underdiagnosing disease if you don't have the right information to make the right um, diagnoses and, and, and choices. So, um, again, I think in high, really the, 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 message, the, Af the message of the implications for health in Africa are enormous. Um, that, and it's not only for nephrology, it's not only for genomics and genomics research, but really extends to every specialty of medicine. So um, Michelle's spoken about examples from common cardiovascular disease. June has spoken about nephrology. But I, again, if we look at some of the rare diseases and common diseases as well, that extends to neurology, to neuromuscular disease. Um, I think pretty much any specialty, there are good examples, hematology, there are good examples of um, African specific examples, which are really the tip of the iceberg. Um, so I think many of the challenges of obtaining the information have been highlighted tonight, and particularly the challenges in translation to practical patient care. So I think in sort of opening the, 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 the floor for discussion, really the, the sort of question around who's responsible, um, June raised it, is it the scientists, is it the clinicians, who is responsible for sort of taking this exciting research 
and really practically making this change patients' lives. So um, I'm going to ask Michelle and June, I think, to come up um, to, to be able to answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> Maria's nodding or not nodding. <laughs> so I thought that I would... So I'm Michelle to have to talk about how you sort of see the world genomic diversity and think about data to the and practicality of if you're faced with a patient, how far do you need to go in terms of sort of finding where they come from? Or you know, how do you how do you do a period school um in somebody who who comes on a Twitter stage by the age of now perhaps the well state population, do you need to sort of use all this knowledge in each case? And how do you do that? So I think you know being mindful of um whether is this not coming through very well? We need to put this off. Um, so, oh, this makes a big difference, doesn't it? <laughs> I can even hear myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, we do have this dilemma. You know, I think even early on when we were doing um, we were doing research on monogenic disorders, where the kits that have been developed for mutations in European populations for cystic fibrosis, for thalassemia, were used here. They often would miss um, a diagnosis because the mutation that is found in African populations isn't on that kit. So we need to make sure that we we first of all do the research in Africa, that we either validate or find new genetic underpinnings of disease before we can introduce it. And I think that's that's really important also for many of these companies who introduce tests for complex traits, um, cardiovascular traits that are not appropriate for African populations. So I think you probably want to comment on the clinical, what do you do with the patients in front of you? <laughs> but, uh, but I think, you know, there's no question that we need more data on more populations and that what works in one African setting may not work in another African setting. Because I think with Awigen, we've shown huge regional differences as well. No, I mean, I think I think there's an impatience from the clinicians, like just give us something so that we know what to use and it will work and we know what to do. Um, and I understand that because otherwise, how do you help the patient? So I think there's this tension between making sure it's really good science, but then also being able to make it practical so that it's almost like, okay, we know it, let's just get on with it. And how do we do that? So I guess the question is, you know, is it point of care? Is it, um, does it have to go to a lab? And how much is that going to cost? And how do we try and get that moving without it? kind of damp squibbing and kind of just again being a really nice example but is it really going to help us at the bedside so i guess that was part of, part of my question was saying how do we um get the message to labs how do we change practice of clinicians you know and how do we how do we get that message out there i mean you alluded to medical students well to doctors and their poor genetic knowledge, medical students. I mean, I think we try. I'm not sure how successful we are. Um, it's not immediately relevant to medical students, you know, when we're teaching them genetics, but obviously this is the medicine of the future and it is something that really needs to be part of clinical care. But, you know, the, those individual findings and how you then get get that message and the access, I guess, is the is the other really important question of, you know, so now you've got children with nephrotic syndrome, but they're not only at Fitzdonald Gordon, they're 
across the country and across the continent, how do you ensure that every single one of those children gets tested before they get or don't get steroids? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things is how do we scale it up? Um, how do you take the really good science and get it to the scale that we want it to be meaningful? And these are not easy things to do. And again, whose job is it? Is it, I mean, we're really bad at public education, but there's a whole lot of people on campus in social sciences who spend their lives studying this and are really good at it, you know. Um, how do we bring those people in to do it a lot better than we could? So, yeah, I think it's all of those things to think about. I don't know if you want to say. So, I'd like to look at this with your questions. Um, I'm hoping there's somebody with a microphone somewhere. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Maureen Joffe, I'm, uh, I'm a collaborator with Michelle and her group. You know, this is the big problem, but I see enormous opportunity. You are showing that Africa is going to be the place where all the population growth is going to occur. If you think about it, it's a continuum of care. We've got to get to the point where we show the problem is sufficiently big that we can get the interest of drug companies to get involved with us for Africa uh, interesting tests to be done. You know, you think of the HIV problem. It, it was big enough and that you engaged companies to produce the drugs to actually cure it. So we've got to say to ourselves, it might not happen in your lifetime, certainly not in mine, but if we, if we continue to do the basic work where we get, we start characterizing the difference, but most importantly, show the volume of people that are affected with the difference. I think that's when you start getting the opportunity for local development of local tests and then advocacy for much cheaper drugs. I mean, it's the same problem in cancer. You know, we are doing 1980s medicine for and the uh, cancer drugs of today in the first world are not available to us. Johnny, uh, thanks very much, Maureen. I think, um, you know, it is important that we now forge these public-private partnerships because pharma have uh, the wherewithal to do and support the research. And I'm just really happy to say that, you know, there's a new initiative um, which is um, defining centers of genomics across Africa. And there are already, I think, 11 pharma companies who are coming together to form a consortium to try and support genomic research in Africa. I don't know how long it's going to take and whether it's going to come to fruition. We hope it will. Um, but, you know, I think there's a greater awareness that the diversity in Africa can benefit the rest of the world. Yeah. It's perhaps still not showing direct translation to the patients and you know i think also it's not only common disease it extends to rare disease as well i mean june showed a couple of examples of particularly expensive well, not, not particularly expensive but the typical kind of price in rare disease of, of drugs and again i think you know there's going to be locally specific or african specific diseases where we've got to kind of get focus on those diseases are there some other comments and some questions? Thank you very much, uh, Yugesh Subramani. I'm from the Department of Psychiatry. Um, so my question obviously relates to serious mental illness and translation of just about everything you've said. So the big issue around advocacy for better treatments for our patient is a huge bugbear for us. And if you take an illness like schizophrenia, which is highly heritable, 
And the fact that most of the patients are treated in the public health sector where access to um, good drugs, drugs that we know to work better, have less side effects, together with the huge conundrum of the cytochrome P450 system and psychopharmacology is the bugbear of most medical students doing and registrars doing psychiatry. Any words of advice that you can give us with regard to setting up a system for better development, better knowledge dispersion, um, reforming the curriculum at medical school, etc. Thanks. <laughs> I'm batting that to Michelle. <laughs> Come on, Judy. <laughs> No, I think it is about, uh, thanks for raising that, because I think, you know, it's every discipline in medicine. And if you don't do the basic research, you don't actually know what to do. So if you want to really examine the outcomes of drugs, um, you, you need to do the work on African patients in Africa, because otherwise you won't know. So I always say we can go so far by informatics wise. You know, we look at variation in genomes, of genes that we know are important in the metabolism of drugs, whether they be for psychiatric diseases or other diseases. But at the end of the day, we've got to do, you know, the, the actual work on putting the phenotype together with the genotype, looking at the response. And I think there's huge potential. We should be doing the work here because we could discover really novel things in terms of new drug targets or, you know, just genetic variants that respond to drugs. I think, Ugesh, um, practically, I think we, in the faculty, we still work in silos. So I think where we've shown that we can do this, and we have a collaboration with Sydney Brenner, and Colin has set up the arrays that pick up variants in Africa for all the cytochrome P450s. Let's start working between us rather than you trying to establish all of that on your own, because it also feels overwhelming. So I think at a practical level, it's about, okay, so we know that we've got these resources. Let's see how we can do a similar thing with psych. And I think we actually can do it and it's quite tangible. And I think it's also just about learning to leverage off each other rather than trying to set up the whole thing all over again and replicate it all. And most people feel overwhelmed and then it just doesn't get done. But I think there's ways that we can really box smart to try and accelerate this kind of work. So I'll be sending you an email. <laughs> hey, how's it going? All right, cool. So um, I have two questions. I think you alluded to the first question um, in your analysis of um, the private sector getting involved because in your presentation, firstly, you mentioned a number of tests that were exclusively available on, um, well, in the international community overseas, right? And that were highly priced for um, our local setting, but what is the, I suppose, the relationship between the South African private sector and um, NHLS? So are there no private biotechnology companies that can provide these tests at a lower cost? And in that happening, we wouldn't have to, I suppose, rely on the European tests or any tests that happen abroad. So that's my first question, right? The second question is... You can stop now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second question is... Um, You've really given a, an incredible analysis of the diagnostics available in terms of the precision medicine available today, but where are we in terms of genetic therapeutics? Because it's amazing that we can do these tests, we can pick up which um, variants you have in your CYP450 or um, what enzymes you have in your fat metabolism or anything in your biochemis biochemical pathways in, in terms of your body, but is there anything that I guess is novel happening in Africa or in the current time that's therapeutic, that's that's genetic related, where we can, um, yeah, intervene on a genetic level. I mean, apart from CRISPR-Cas and that type of stuff, like what what else is there? <laughs> um, those are my questions. So yeah, thank you very much. Um. Um, Amanda, I, I don't know if you want to respond to what alternatives are there to NHLS. Um, <laughs> like, no, I mean, I think the problem is that the minute you do that, you, a whole, the majority of the population of the country lose access to testing. And I think that's always the, let's stick with NHLS. But the question is, um, 
if the NHLS can't provide, then what do we do? Because those patients are going without the testing anyway. So I think these are really difficult things to try and tease out on how to work this out. So I don't know if you want to respond, Amanda. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I think we do. We have a, a, a healthcare system where the majority of people are dependent on a state-funded system and a relatively poorly state-funded system for their service and for their access to testing. And obviously, our sort of primary aim is is to try and ensure access within that system. I mean, to answer your your sort of question about biotech companies. Michelle, I don't know if you can answer better than I can, but in truth, one of the challenges of the private companies is not only that they come in, charge higher rates, in fact, than we can sometimes get it done in the US, but are not doing locally appropriate testing either. So they're bringing their array or their whatever from the US. And then actually it's not serving the broad population either because they haven't appropriately sort of modified it for the local population. So, I mean, there's an enormous opportunity and an enormous challenge in trying to get a board appropriate testing so that we can cover, you know, precision medicine in its entirety. I mean, Michelle and, and June have sort of alluded to small areas of it, but I mean, one of the challenges is there's psychiatry, there's neuromuscular, there's developmental delay, there's, you know, and so any sort of model, there's cancer that Maureen alluded to, all of those have to really be, you know, encompassed in a, in a sort of, not to say that we shouldn't be doing it, but, but really our approach needs to sort of put all of those together. And maybe and sorry, your second question about therapeutics. Um, <laughs> so again, I think, I think gene therapy in various forms is, is a rapidly developing field, again, an incredibly expensive field. And so again, sort of trying to make sure that therapeutics happen in the right places is, is something that is certainly an important area. I mean, there are, there are some, I'm not sure how far they are, but I mean, there's sort of the one a group of trials that are aiming at Africa, are the sickle cell trials, and again, there's sort of some hope of a model of a, a system that might work in, in low resourced or relatively low resourced environments. Maria, you want to comment? So in fact, uh, Professor Johnny Machlangu in our faculty is doing a clinical trial for gene therapy for hemophilia to replace factor eight. Um, and it's either, don't quote me, it's either an adenovirus or an adeno-associated virus vector. So they're injecting patients with that. Um, and that is basically then going on expressing the protein. And uh, they've had really good results. Uh, you know, the, the vector stays in there and it expresses protein for well over five or so years as, as far as they've been um, testing it for. So you know, it's it's a massive area, gene therapy. Um, we are actually doing some trials in our faculty. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just you. Oh, oh, it's I'm trying to keep track of where the microphones are. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, sorry, I'm a baby in the sense that I'm only a fourth year medical student. So I'm sorry <laughs> if my question is quite straightforward. Um, but my, sorry, I don't even know how to phrase this, but essentially, right, you're talking about the applicability of African-American data in an African context. So my question is, after how many generations does data of migrants no longer become applicable to our African context? Um, and then, for example, if we were to, I think first prize, as you mentioned, is to do the research on our continent. But if European researchers were to do research, for example, on Libyan refugees in Italy or Tunisian refugees and then apply that to our continent, is that applicable? And then after how long, if we look at globalization patterns and migration, sorry, then do we expect or anticipate that um, 
African genetic mutations through these migratory patterns will then be introduced into a European population, right? So I'm looking at that as like a selling point or factor to do this research. If you are anticipating that European populations in X generations amount of time will then have this apple oil, 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 that one, yes, one gene integrated into their population as a cause for prevalence for chronic kidney disease, et cetera. Those are all great questions, and I'm so happy that you're thinking about this as a fourth year medical student, because we should be doing that. So, um, you know, when we talk about African Americans, they're mostly admixed, and they can have anywhere from a very small proportion of African ancestry to a lot. And that's why, you know, we, we really are concerned about them being used as proxies for everything that happens on continental Africa. So I think, you know, we need to be aware of that. Now, admixture is important and we're going to, and we see it more and more. So we need to understand when we're developing things like genetic risk scores, um, how do we deal with that to make sure that the prediction is the best that it can be? So that is really, really important. Um, there was another point that you made that I thought was really um, pertinent. It was the second point. What was that about again? About, yes, about African populations going into different parts of the world, because they're very big communities that are actually born in Africa, but now living in other countries. And one of the things we're very mindful of with these complex traits is that there's often a gene environment interaction. So, you know, when you have um, a Ghanaian population in Ghana, but you have another one in the Netherlands, and you look at the prevalence of diseases that can often be different because of gene environment interactions. So we can never study genetics just on its own and think that it's gonna be the answer. <clears throat> you need to really consider so many other things. It's, it's probably not so true for rare diseases and monogenic diseases where it's a direct genotype phenotype correlation, but for these complex diseases, context is really important. Thank you so much. My name is Catherine. Um, what an honor it is to be here this evening to listen to this outstanding lecture and all the questions. I just wanted to go back to June's second last slide, and it's something that Michelle alluded to at the beginning as well, and that is the question of how we move the paradigm to the next step, which is obviously treatment and facing uh, people who need care, and that's all of your goals. And June pointed out that you need a lot of people in the room to make that happen. So a couple of uh, years ago, during the first year of the pandemic, we ran a, a podcast series from the medical humanities health system space. And we got uh, hundreds and hundreds of people coming to the Zoom lecture that June was on, where she gave a very precise version of some of her PhD work that she alluded to also at the second part of the talk. And she also told the, the group about the Sydney Brenner Institute and also about where she's based, which is the Donald Gordon, Fitz Donald Gordon Center. And we were absolutely astounded to find in our survey af afterwards that more people knew about these two institutes and actually who Donald Gordon was and who Sidney Brenner was from the Faculty of Humanities and Law than the Faculty of Health Science. Then we did a little bit more digging down and we found out that in it takes until about fifth year, so it's wonderful to have a fourth year here, before most fifth years even know where those two places are. And so we really have to step up and make sure, and we will next year with the big April event, that students and this campus get uh, tuned into these multiple sister disciplines to their own, that nurses and doctors to be work closely with people who are experts in advocacy in sociology and history, in anthropology and health economics. But we, when, and we're doing that, we're trying to build the bridges, but we also need to, I think, let people get excited by and motivated by the outstanding research and clinician linked research of this faculty. And we're doing a really, really bad job at advertising the outstanding work to first to fourth years who would be so inspired by this and who would begin to think about these questions fundamentally. And so the curriculum would also uh, respond dialogically to the students thirst. So let's not keep these lectures for special events in the evening, but find ways to constantly um, move them like a golden thread through the undergraduate curriculum of this faculty. So, so I think our dean is very much on the same page as you are. Um, 
with that comment. So I'm sure he's going to say something in a few minutes. Are, are there any final questions? There's there's a question here. Have you got a microphone? Maybe the, the last question. Are there, are there any other questions? Okay, so maybe two more questions and then we need to, otherwise we could be here all night. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Just like her, I'm also a baby in the business. <laughs> yeah, my trouble is mainly with uh, defining population in genomic studies. And uh, probably because of historical events, uh, things can be quite complicated at times. So please, Professor Ramsey, maybe based on your experience, what do you think the best way now scientific wise to define populations? Do we stick to the geographical distribution of people, the languages or what else? Because sometimes, especially with ethical committees, you land into big troubles and have so many, uh, you find it difficult to, to define some lines actually, and uh, you don't want, yeah, that's basically, thank you. Sure. I think I can just say it's it's a very pertinent question. It's a topic that I think we could talk hours and hours about, and I think maybe we need another session to talk about race, ethnicity, ancestry, and really how we define that in a maybe in a context of uh, research or medicine. So thanks for raising that. I think there's a topic for the future. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Nondumi, so I'm from uh, pharmacology. My question really is about the role and involvement of the medicines regulator um, in each country, whether we now have AMA coming up, which is the African um, Medicines Authority or agency, and what we're doing as a South African health uh, SAPRA, uh, as well as other regional medicine regulators. The US FDA has uh, PGX labeled uh, products. What do we have? What initiatives have been put in place to begin some talks, some engagement of sorts to see that the regulator plays its role? We have huge issues in pharmacovigilance. We see molecules that are just not talking to our population, but nothing is being done. And for me, this is such an obvious solution to much of what's happening. So that's really what I'd like to propose. Thank you. It's a great point. Um, Colin Masumiri was working with some colleagues at CSR and they're looking at adverse events and how a lot of those are caused because patients are getting the wrong doses of things because they're metabolizing things differently. And adverse events is a huge cause of hospitalizations in this country and unnecessary cost, aside from the fact that sometimes patients die from them. So I think it's a very valid point. Again, the question is who does the engagement? Um, is it you because you're a pharmacologist? <laughs> um, you know, I think those are the practical things. Um, the FDA has published regulations. If you look at the labels for clopidogrel, it'll tell you if you've got a genomic mutation, blah, blah, you should be getting this dose. It's all there. Um, we're doing nothing about it. And the regulators are doing nothing about it. If SAPRA passed a regulation that these tests had to be done before they were used in this country to inform the doses that we're giving patients, that would be a huge step towards getting these tests approved and into the clinical space. So I think that's what we were saying in the last slide is that all of those things need to happen. That this kind of work can't ever be successful if it's in isolation, but that's a fantastic point. Thank you. But maybe just to add to that point that it's it's no use just translating the FDA recommendations. You know, we have to have the local variants included in those testing and access for patients. So, you know, again, it comes to the same point. So um, there's one very key last question. I think it has to be the last question. Thank you. I'm Stephanie and I'm with IBM Research here in Johannesburg. Um, I must say thank you very much for your talk this evening. It resonated with me specifically because with my PhD, I was looking at um, susceptibility for our South African colored population to, to tuberculosis. Um, so I understand the complexities of doing this type of research. So. The first question I wanted to ask is, how much is enough? For our type of populations, the diversity we have, 
the complexity of our socioeconomic um, environments, will we ever have enough data? <laughs> and then <laughs> on top of that, if we think of sustainable research, not for the next 10 years, 20 years, for the next 100 years, what are the type of technologies we need to be focusing on so that we can use smaller, smaller data sets with advanced technologies? So has there been some discussions around that? Are there considerations for how we can um, work on these pipelines to, like I say, work with smaller data sets? Maybe just what we have, what our funds can give us so that we can get to the solutions faster. Thank you. Do you want to ask? <laughs> I think it's I a think fantastic they... point to to really end the discussion um, largely and say we don't know, you know, and obviously we are saying diversity, the more you look, the more you find, um, but we have to, and, and I guess it was part of sort of my starting the discussion of saying we have to come to a point where we have a practical translation of it. I'm not sure we know what the answer is, but Michelle, I don't know if you want to... No, I think that's absolutely perfect. And um, I think we are developing techniques where we can use smaller sample sizes. But if you want representation, you need to look at more people. So um, with that, I'm going to conclude my part of the discussion and hand over to the dean. So good evening. And I think Michelle June and Amanda do deserve another round of applause. So Michelle and June, thanks for that brilliant uh, presentation. It actually makes me want to go back to medical school or at the least actually change <laughs> or at the least change my focus of research. I think what you're doing is seems much, much more exciting than what I get to do. Uh, I mean, so I'm not too sure whether it's by design, Maria, or whether it just happened to be that on the 1st of August, the start of Women's Month, uh, we end up having two speakers that are women, we end up having a commentator that's a woman, and we end up having the chair that's a woman. Uh, so I'm not too sure whether it's by design. Uh, we all know that this uh, start today is the 1st of August, which is the Women's Month, really to acknowledge the strength of women and their contribution to society. We also know that it leads up to the 9th of August, which is Women's Day. And I think all of us that are of my age at least, uh, and hopefully the younger ones as well, might recall a phrase that was, uh, that was really the phrase that, that the government of the day faced on the 9th of August. And that is, you strike the woman, you strike a rock. And that was really to symbolize the courage and strength of women. And I think what we saw today is really a testimony to the courage on the part of Michelle to actually embark on research, which very few other people were thinking about at that point in time. And over the less than a decade now, it's grown into something which is really internationally recognized. So Michelle, well done to you in a group, really for pioneering. Really for pioneering the type of work you do that we can all be proud of. Uh, June, you probably bring about the balance in terms of the age spectrum. And I think that's really good to actually see that we're getting this, uh, we're addressing this concern that many of the leading researchers in the faculty are reaching towards retirement age. And it's wonderful to see more junior, relatively junior people coming up and being able to step into place once those that have retired move on. So the research that both of you have presented on really also illustrates excellence, excellence of research that takes place at WITS, uh, something that we can really be proud of. Uh, I think what you bring to the fore is that WITS can hold its space. Michelle, the one point that you really repeated on two occasions uh, is that we need to be doing research to benefit the African population. You need to research, the research must be done in Africa. One of the big criticisms at times of this university in particular is that we haven't decolonized. And we really need to un 
unpack what do we mean by decolonization? And the type of research both of you have presented is really about decolonization. It's about making sure that the type of research that we do is relevant to the African population. And for me, that is the type of decolonization that we need to be championing. So we all done on that front as well. So one of the points that was made is that many of our medical students don't have not heard of the, of the Donald Gordon uh, the Bert's Donald Gordon Medical Center or the Sydney Brenner Institute, and that's true. Uh, but as you're fully aware, what we're right, doing right now, and again, it speaks to the issue and it speaks to the content of the presentation, is that in this day and age, for us to continue championing a curriculum at this university, which hasn't changed substantially since I was a first year student in 1985, really speaks to itself. So what we're embarking on is that from next year, we will actually be embarking on a new MBBCH curriculum. And the purpose of that curriculum is to make sure that we're training doctors that are fit for purpose. We are training doctors that will be competitive in the 21st century. We are training doctors that would understand the concepts of precision medicine, that would understand the type of work you're actually presenting. But at the same time, that curriculum revision only works. And in this audience, there are a number of people, myself included until recently. The point that was made is that we shouldn't be having medical students, one or two, attend this type of a lecture to hear about the type of work that's being done. This type of research needs to be taken to the undergraduate classes. And again, it beats me how a university of Advertisement has senior researchers, senior professors, full professors, that will never have lectured a single undergraduate class in 10 to 15 years, in 20 years, myself included. And it speaks about how we see our curriculum, how we deliver content, and why we need to reflect on what we're doing right now and actually basically move on and readjust in terms of how we actually engage with undergraduate students. If we want to, for research to survive at this university, we need a senior in the undergrad class igniting the type of interest, the type of passion that you have for the work that you do to the students themselves, imparting that to the students. So that is a challenge for full professors in this audience, as well as for our colleagues in our research, in our labs, in our units, that they've never lectured. And again, it's about how we design our curriculum to afford the students that opportunity. So like I said, we are bringing about a revision in terms of our curriculum, and I'm really optimistic that we are going to have a curriculum that is going to be something to be proud of in the university. There's benchmark against international standards. For a student that asked that question, uh, you matriculated PhD program where we had a first intake. <laughs> we had a first intake of three students this year into this intercalated PhD program, where we are really trying to get, get the students started in the PhD and hopefully they'll be able to graduate with both the PhD as well as an MBCH. So the good news for you is I found you, I found you two supervisors. You've got research at hand. You speak to Maria after this in terms of getting into the program for tech. So with us, I, to be honest, I think that's the highlight of my evening. Undergraduate student that take these sort of functions. And I hope it's some it's a type of uh, and I'm sure there's a few other undergraduate students that have been keeping quiet, but it's of interest. Uh, which excites me in that there is a future when it comes to research, when it comes to academia in South Africa and at this university. So with those few words, Charles, Amanda, and Jane, if you mind coming up, I've got some things I need. To... <laughs> He's got no, this is yours. Thanks a lot. <laughs> This is that time of the evening when my eyesight goes down and I didn't, and I forgot to bring my glasses. So just bear with me. Okay, maybe we're coming to the end of this uh, particular session. So just it remains for me to thank a few people. Firstly, to thank Nomfundo, who was solely responsible 
for having organized this particular meeting. Nomfondo, thanks a lot. Where are you? You can stand up. Nomfondo, you can stand up so people can see you. Uh, and then the Vessels Consortium, I don't think anyone from the Vessel from Management of Wales Health Consortium is here. This function wouldn't be possible without their generous support. But again, it's the researchers that make the sorting for us being able to support this sort of function and then obviously last but not least to thank the audience about those that have attended in person as well as those that have joined us virtually unfortunately we weren't able to get to those that joined virtually for a question for questions simply because we were overwhelmed by this audience with their questions but again thanks for attending and making this a worthwhile ev uh, evening and event Last but not least, please feel free to join us outside for refreshments. And Maria, thanks for having organized. And well done again, one speakers.